They planned it to be a murder of a 14-year-old black boy. They planned for him to be tortured. They planned for him to be put in a pine box, nailed shut so that it would be secret. The pain, the trauma of African Americans um, over the years has taken its toll on us as a people. The most common thing you hear is we weren't born then, so why are you holding us accountable? White America was wrong. It did something unspeakably horrific for four centuries. And to come to terms with that takes an enormous amount of moral courage. We're talking about human beings that need to understand each other, and that seldom happens. We've got to recognize the fact that we do live in the longest standing white supremacist order in history. The trauma of that is unbelievably catastrophic. Religion and the church have a role to call injustices by name, to uh, identify the continuing evils in our world. Only God can heal the trauma. Only God. We see the sins of the Father passed down from generation to generation, all the way back to the separation of the families. Reverend Keith Williams recognizes how the trauma passed down from his ancestors still affects him today. My Lord. I can't imagine the physiological and the emotional and the psychological trauma that my forefathers experienced. Lord, I'll never. The wounds of slavery last for a very, very long time, and often they are not addressed. People are too ashamed or they don't know where to go with it. Dr. Harriet Hill, an expert in biblical trauma healing, says people today still feel the post-traumatic effects of slavery. It's not that these people living today were enslaved, but they have that heritage of the shame and the, the violence that was committed against them. Well, for many of our families, we don't have to go back to the Middle Passage to know what post-traumatic stress syndrome is. The effects of oppression are still reverberating in our society today. This was August 24th, 1955. He was taken to the Sheridan Plantation to a shed and there he was brutally beaten. Phyllis Smith was six years old when she first learned about the highly publicized murder of her cousin, Emmett Till. Money, Mississippi, a story that shocked the entire United States. Emmett Till, 14, visiting his uncle Mose Wright, was kidnapped and killed allegedly for wolf whistling at the wife of accused Roy Bryan. Emmett was known as Bobo, and we loved him. He had it all. He was charismatic, he was conversational, he was cute, and all of the younger cousins adored him and I was one of those. On his 14th birthday, Bobo from Chicago wanted to visit family in Mississippi and begged his mother to allow him to travel to the unknown Southern Serene. And they took him to the uh, Tallahatchie River, tied this 70 pound cotton gin fan around his neck and threw him into the river. Mamie Till sought help from law enforcement, Congress, and even President Dwight D. Eisenhower. She wanted justice for the brutal crime committed against her only child. Emma's mother had insisted that the coffin be open and she wanted to let the world know what had been done to her son. Lord, and, your hand, Lord. and what did God turn it into? God turned it into something in which it was not a nailed pine box, it was an open coffin. So the whole world could see the heinous, torturous evil perpetuated against my cousins. Bryant and his half-brother, J.W. Milam, were acquitted by this jury. And subsequently, even though they admitted taking the boy from the house, they were freed of kidnap charges. Four months after the trial, Look Magazine published the brothers' confessions. Their interviews detailed how they tortured and killed a Negro boy from Chicago. It's even larger than 
a racial crime against all blacks. It's larger than that. It's actually a crime against humanity. With Emmett Till and all the other lynchings that went on, they did it with impunity. Right up to the time of the Civil Rights Movement, a lot of those cases where they murdered black children in a church, where they murdered civil rights workers. Dr. Alvin Poussaint, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, devoted his entire career to African-American history. There's still problems of uh, discrimination in many uh, institutions. No matter how protected I may feel being at Harvard, I have to watch television, read the newspapers, and deal with the people getting, getting shot and killed and abused and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of identification and stress that goes with observing it and look, watching it. Right? So it's like you can't escape it. At the time I was uh, six years old, and I knew that Mamie, my cousin, had asked my dad, what should I tell Emmett? And my dad was very much against uh, Bobo going to Mississippi and told her um, he doesn't understand the ways. You have to know your place to make it down there, and he will not know his place. Mamie, don't let him go. And I think it's something that uh, really haunted him the rest of his life. A short life at that. Seven years later, Phyllis's father, Sam Smith, died and in death received an indignity that further deepened Phyllis's pain. We had to delay the funeral because there was no cemetery in the western suburbs who would take a quote colored man. And all of these things built up inside of me uh, in terms of emotional trauma and, and anger. I think when you don't process uh, trauma or you don't process it well, you become stuck. You become arrested at the point of the trauma. And I think in many ways, um, until now, I have been stuck as that six-year-old. I don't think it's possible, really, uh, for somebody to walk in my shoes, uh, even though they might wear a 12. 83-year-old Dr. Gus Roman grew up in New Orleans when Jim Crow laws kept black Americans deeply segregated and in constant fear. Losing my life was a serious reality because you never knew, you never knew when you would meet those people who were so thoughtless about black life, care so little about black life. You never knew when you were gonna meet them. While his mother worked as a maid, Gus polished shoes in the French Quarter to help pay the bills. One particular time, uh, I shined the shoes for a chap in the French market. And for some reason, he refused to give me the fee for shining his shoes. And even went beyond that and became angry and just put his shoe in my stomach. And I could never understand that. You know, even if you don't want to pay me, there's no reason to kick me. Gus also found no reason for blacks to endure daily injustice. He began to lose hope in his faith. I asked God a question. I say, is it that you just love white folks? Why is it you, you do all these things for white folks and don't do anything for us? That was the turning point. That's when the relationship started. That's when prayer became meaningful. That's when God became real. A turning point that led him to pursue a theology degree and begin his lifelong call addressing race in America. I know what it did to our spirit. And I know what it did to their spirit. To ask that question, why do you do all of this for them? And you don't do anything much for us. And, uh, and I remember the answer of God. He said, no. No. 
Don't you ever believe that. That was the beginning of the journey. The conscious journey with God. I know that my grandfather was a clan member for a time. I think that in terms of the subsequent generations, my parents' generations, they, they made a, a break from that. Um, but the legacies of, of that history you know, remain. Reverend Greg Thompson grew up in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. As a child living in the segregated South, he never really thought about his racial identity until one fateful day in elementary school. I was in fourth grade. My best friend was an African-American boy uh, who had the same name as me. We were known as the Two Gregs. We were fourth grade boys, so we got in lots of trouble lots of times. You know, we were always joking. And I remember this one day, the teacher called us down. Uh, we both laughed, but she came and grabbed him by his shirt and threw him against a chalkboard in front of the whole class and said to him, why don't you wipe that smile off your face? To be held up in front of the whole class as this, this something fundamentally wrong with him in a way that is visible on his face, that our, that our teacher, who we all look to, pointed out for us. And I spent a lot of time thinking about what, what the trauma of that was for him. But the other trauma is the trauma of shame. Because uh, as a child, I, I knew that I didn't come to his defense. I felt embarrassed about that. Uh, and that's been a reverberating, concussive kind of shame over the course of my life when I've realized more and more just how deeply embedded these assumptions were. I actually think that's deeply embedded in the white imagination. As a child, Greg developed a strategy for dealing with the shame and trauma he experienced as he watched his closest friend publicly humiliated. I mean, we were two boys, we had the same name. We were doing the same thing. And I think that I learned that in that moment in the fourth grade classroom that he was chosen and I wasn't because something was wrong with him that wasn't wrong with me. The last real memory I have of him, honestly, is that afternoon we were on the playground together and he was playing off by the side of the, of the playground by himself and I went over and kind of sat down in front of him and I just remember watching his tears hit the, hit the dirt. Um, I have literally no memories of him after that. It destroys the person from the inside out. Um, hate is a malignant spiritual cancer that will spread beyond the, the boundaries of what one had intended for it to do towards a particular group and actually consumes the person. Psychiatrist Dr. Michael Lyles says that how we treat other people directly affects our own self-worth. It affects your ability to develop healthy relationships with other people of your own racial group in your own family and affects your ability to have a true positive self-image of yourself. If your self-image has to be based on you being better than somebody else, it's a very insecure self-image. Reverend Greg Thompson now lives in Charlottesville, Virginia, the birthplace of three American presidents who built a nation on the principle that all men are created equal. Historically and sociologically, you have to understand that American culture was founded on democratic principles, but understood those principles in white supremacist terms. And, and not just white supremacists, but also white supremacist male terms. Um, that the institutions of American culture were largely created in a mindset that, uh, per where they pertain to men and they pertain to white European men. 400 years of slavery, uh, 100 years pretty much of Jim Crow, um, a small window of a civil rights movement. And to think that all of the centuries of inbred racism and inequality would be overcome by a singular movement is at best a wish, at worst it's illogical. Dr. Charlie Dates is an expert on the 20th century black church and its role in American history. Gardner Taylor, the dean of black preachers, whose name now belongs to the ages, he said that racism laid like a sleeping coil underneath 
the table at the Constitutional Convention. That while the ink was still wet on the Constitution, racism was alive and well, breathing through the ink. In order to justify a system that on the one hand says that everybody's created equal and has these unalienable rights, right? And at the same time, you're enslaving all of these people, up to eight million of your neighbors. That requires you to develop certain strategies. And those strategies are animalization, that they're not human. Um, this kind of demonization, that they are human, but that something is very wrong with them. Or this infantilization, which is to say, they're human, nothing's really wrong with them, but they're just really not our equals. And that, that has been at the heart of the white American characterization of black Americans from the beginning. I've got a number of friends, uh, non-black friends, white friends in particular, who will say to me, I'm not racist. I wasn't around during Jim Crow. I, as a matter of fact, I had nothing to do with anything of the problems of black people now. And I would say to many of them, you're probably not racist, but you are privileged. And you live by a privileged code in America that gives you an advantage over people like me. Morally, I've had to heal by letting African Americans say things to me like, you don't understand your privilege, or you don't understand uh, how much you don't think about us. I've had to heal morally by listening to that. And so healing is gonna be a long-term process for me and for all of us. Demonstrating and parading without a permit. How long does it take psychologically to overcome 350 years of slavery and Jim Crow segregation. Uh, how could people today still be dealing with this, the problems re related to race? It makes an assumption that we talked about it and dealt with it back then, which we didn't. Right after the Civil War, Southern states enacted Jim Crow laws, meant to keep blacks separate from whites in every area of life. The very purpose of segregation was not to hate black people. It was to imagine that they didn't exist. It was to give them stairways in another part of the house. It was to give them bathrooms somewhere else. It was to give them schools somewhere else. It was to let them have their churches, start their banks, do whatever they wanted to do as long as we didn't have to see it. Even after the Supreme Court dismantled these laws in the 50s, segregation remained alive and well until the late 60s almost a hundred years after slavery ended. We've only been liberated for how many years now? 60? And I say liberated because I'm thinking about the Civil Rights Act of 1964-1965, right? That may be end Jim Crow, but look how long it's lingered. Look at the, the residues and remnants of, of Jim Crow segregation around the country. This has been a constant criticism from African-American intellectual community of American whites that segregation has created a form of moral damage in us, a form of moral blindness. I think sometimes they may keep it quiet. Uh, when whites ask him about it, it could be that, well, I'm not going to talk about it because you're not going to understand me anyway. Imagine if you're in a place and you see people around you that you know are in poverty, that you know are being harmed, that you know are being abused, that you know their lives are just not going to be what your life is gonna be. Which is what white Americans have had to know about African Americans for four centuries, to the extent that they've thought about it. Now imagine then that the only social option available to you, this only social acceptable option available to you is to ignore that or worse, to blame them for that. That creates a, a fundamental habit of self-deceit. It's a willed sort of moral blindness. And that is a profound form of damage. We blame poor people in this country for being poor. We don't blame the fact we don't pay them enough even though they're working full time. We just say something's wrong with them that they don't have any money. So it, it contributes to the feelings of being uh, an outsider, and being stigmatized and stereotyped. And I think that that kind of trauma is, is extraordinarily profound. And people who do trauma theory, one of the things that you see is that for all of the evident and catastrophic trauma to the victims, the oppressors become so damaged 
by harming other people. That's one of, and that's one of the reasons it makes it so hard to heal from this. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. That's why Dr. King said that part of the answer was going to be spiritual. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Damaging another person damages you. That enslaving another person enslaves you. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. That rejecting another person ends up a form of self-rejection and self-harm. The rich man can never be what he ought to be until the poor man is what he ought to be. And so I think the call to listen and say, how can we do this together? Here's what I'm bringing to the table. What do you think we should do? That for me is gonna be a really important step as we go forward. Many of our people are still suffering from the, the memories and they buried them so deep that they can't even talk about. It. The trauma still lingers and is intergenerational. Right? Just like the trauma of the Holocaust is intergenerational. I have a 98-year-old grandmother. It's difficult for her to talk about some of the things that she experienced as the effects of being treated like she was three-fifths of a person uh, back then. Today, Hattie Williams, Keith's grandmother, remembers living through the Jim Crow South. One generation closer to her slave descendants, she still carries its trauma. I don't care how good a white person is to a black person. They're that far from, from calling them a n than you would to. You would to, unless God has really touched your heart. You would to. My mother was born in Georgia. She moved to Pennsylvania when she was six years old. Hattie's daughter, 76-year-old Doris Howard, grew up in the North, but still feels the pain her ancestors experienced growing up in the South. Grandfather and grandmother, why'd they come up here? For a better life than down South. The grass was green on the other side of the railroad truck. Doris's grandfather, Spurgeon Marshall left Georgia during the Great Migration when nearly 11 million Negroes sought a better life up north. But escape from the rural South did not always mean more freedom. My mother's father went to jail because they had segregated the schools. And he said rather than have his children go to an all-black school, he would go to jail. My grandfather went to jail for that. And it grew up in me. What grew up in her? A symptom researchers describe as post-traumatic slave syndrome, a survival mentality stemming back to her ancestors. The trauma of the oppression and abuse is intergenerational. Black women will say and black mothers that the, one of the major pressures on them is, is to protect their children. Discipline was harsh, it was very harsh because they knew that if I didn't train my child, my African-American son, to learn how to submit to authority and obey authority and respect authority, he'd end up in the penal institution. Parents have to be stricter, strict with their children and make them obedient because they feel that they pay a high price for disobedience. You may get, get arrested and go to jail, right? The white man didn't really care whether we got an education, whether we ate, so therefore, I tried the very best that I could to prepare my children for this cold, cruel world. To prepare her children for the cold, cruel world, Doris raised them with a firm, disciplined hand. So I used to say to him, Keith, you have to pick up your room before baseball. Oh, I'll do it. Keith, you have to pick up your room before baseball. Keith, you have to do the room. So he didn't do it. And I went upstairs and dumped everything on the floor, the box spring, the mattresses, the drawers, all the clothes, everything on the floor. From that day to this, I don't think Keith lays anything anywhere. According to Dr. Poussant, 
These strict disciplinary measures are learned behaviors passed down through generations. My mother was very strict. If my mother woke up at 3 a.m., you got up at 3 a.m. If she said, today we're scrubbing walls, and we scrubbed walls and woodwork and paint and windows like you would not believe. She did not play. My mama didn't play. Matter of fact, she told me, if I'm dead in the grave and tell you to move, you better move. Now, if she's dead in the grave and I hear her say move, she don't have to worry about me moving. But um, that's how tight it was. But I thank God that she was that strict on me. With this no-nonsense upbringing, Doris had little time for anything else. When Keith decided it was time for him to go to school, I worked three jobs. I worked at the hospital, I cleaned houses, and I ironed at night because that's what he wanted to go to school. And many times our parents, nobody wrapped their arms around them and told them they loved them, they cared about them. They were too busy trying to put food on the table and clothes on their back. <laughs> Keith's children live four generations past their ancestors' trauma. They feel the pain their father carries, a wound he tries to keep from them. It was hard for him to open up because his mother wouldn't open up and his grandmother wouldn't open up. So with all these unanswered questions and here comes me with all the questions and being rejected and not understanding what was going on. My father spent a lot of time never being told that he was loved growing up, you know, never hearing the words, I love you. You know, for us, we feel a little bit of that. My father is the most giving, loving, generous person I know. But he's so hard on himself. He's so hard on himself. I think sometimes he feels less than because of his past and ashamed. And I think he may have felt that way due to nobody talking about it. We gotta break those barriers. We gotta break them. Time does not necessarily heal. People can be bitter for their entire lives. So the Dr. Harriet Hill leads a biblical trauma healing session here in Philadelphia. He's going to sit down and, and maybe, maybe have his devotions, think about God a little bit. Today, Reverend Keith Williams learns to break the emotional chains learned from his ancestors. And Patty's saying, what's going on here? And so there can be healing that takes place between the children of the slaves and the children of the slave owners to help them see that God loves them. Through this seminar, Reverend Keith Williams begins his own trauma healing process. One of the great aspects of the training, other people listened to me. They didn't analyze, criticize, or judge. They just heard my heart. And they were there to be a listening ear and a catalyst of healing. And so that's little by little how our brains heal, how we heal of trauma. It's by telling somebody about it. Trauma and the bitterness doesn't come like with a big sign on your head that, you know, now I'm traumatized. You remember the experience, but not with those same emotions, uh, those painful emotions. But now replaced with emotions of my friend listened to me. She accepted me. She loved me. Yeah. yeah. Like you always know. Or sometimes we don't know how bitterness affects us. Right. Yeah. This training is training that everybody on the planet needs. Because if the truth be told, all of us are on the verge of quiet desperation. There's a restlessness underneath the skin. This program combines best psychology practices and traditional biblical principles to heal wounds of the heart. The real stories of real people in the Bible went through incredible trauma, loss, hurt pain, suffering, and, and all of them were men and women like you and you and me. Dr. Roy Peterson, president of American Bible Society, says that trauma is a main theme in the Bible. We have the role model of Christ himself, God incarnate, who came to earth. He was treated the most horribly of all the characters in the Bible. He becomes a role model as we go through horrible things in life, we actually can look to him and learn to forgive 
those that are hurting us. And it frees us up to live with joy and with forgiveness and a happiness that's otherwise impossible in human nature. Scripture says it's a freedom that leads to real healing from the wounds of trauma. In that context, when we actually saw that God's Word could help people overcome trauma in a way like nothing else on earth can do. Nothing else on earth allowed Keith to break the painful emotional chains passed down from four generations. I got from this seminar that I can take back to my church and community that healing is available and that there's a safe place that you can come and share your pain and get healing for your pain. Dr. Charles Dates says that healing from racial trauma must begin with the Christian faith. An example from the scriptures need look no further than Jesus Christ, who had all the privilege there was, but laid it aside so that others could get that privilege. He is our model in birth, in living, and in his humility in dying. And the scripture says in Philippians 2, that for that reason, God highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It seems to me like God honors when people give up privilege for the benefit of those who have none. God's people are called to actually go and build new institutions, to build new kinds of schools, new kinds of police departments, new kinds of hospital systems, new kinds of governments. To do just that, Dr. Greg Thompson founded New City Commons, where he educates teachers, doctors, <laughs> law enforcers, and his own congregation. We are called to participate in creating the institutions that make human beings thrive. We believe that God loves the world. All healing, when it comes, comes as a gift of God. Uh, it comes from His grace to us. And that because God loves the world, He mourns its shadows. One of the joys is that Christians believe that we have a God that actually wants to heal us, wants us to be healed, and wants our neighborhoods and our nations to be healed. And because He mourns its shadows, He wants to bring the light of the world and has in fact done that through Jesus. And there's a lot of hope that comes from that. This pastor also healed, ironically, by attending church. I began to apprentice myself to the black church and to King especially that I feel like I began to really see that the way to deal with shame is not to deny it, not to try to um, atone for it through all these social acts, but I had to actually repent. And I had to say, I was wrong. Now I need somebody to teach me how to, how to live rightly. And that's what my adult life has been. There would be those who would take issue with me, say there is no black church or there is no white church. But be clear, there is a black church in America. God's amazing grace. There's a reason that the black church exists. And I think the black church has the greatest opportunity to mend the racial tension in America. Something about God's grace. We experience the power of God along a biblical narrative that may not have happened apart from the American slavery system. Since the beginning of American history, the black church served as a safe haven for its people. Black people in America who were brought here against their will, um, <laughs> who are not natives as it were, as a result of the atrocities of slavery, experienced the power of God. Black Americans also experienced God's power during the Great Migration in Chicago beginning in 1916. For nearly 60 years, members from Reverend Date's Progressive Baptist Church welcomed thousands of blacks fleeing oppression in the South. And it was their job to meet migrants at the train stations, to help them find housing, churches, employment. And this during a time when literally black Americans were moving to Chicago not knowing anybody. here in Chicago, we have some challenging days ahead, Amen. some great and noble opportunities 
to make this beautiful city that sits on the banks of Lake Michigan, the beautiful city of brotherhood that it is called to be. Churches also help uh, black Americans learn how to uh, adjust, not assimilate, but adjust to the culture, how to dress, how to do life uh, with people who are not as polite as they were in the South, how to develop networks and connections where you could get a job, meet people, build a family. And this church, along with many others, did that. This is the only church that I know. This is the only church I know. This church has been a beacon to me. Susan Moody grew up in Keith Williams Nazarene Baptist Church. Founded in 1896, this church was the first building on the block and a cornerstone for the African-American migrants moving to Philadelphia. They were very proud. They were respectful. They dressed a certain way when they came into church. They dressed a certain day, way when they went to market, okay, because they wanted to represent themselves in a proper way. And they were very, very proud people. And I think that is something that we can go back to today. Proud people that held few earthly goods, but carried one valuable possession. It was our faith. Buddha. The black church has demonstrated and illustrated, practiced uh, the word of Jesus Christ in such a way through massive intellect, uh, passionate expression, graceful service, and a kind of undying devotion to the least, the lost, and the left out. It has done so in such a way where it's preserved the soul of black America. You can go to any city in America and this story holds true. Struggle, sacrifice, transformation, community, faith. This story is important because it represents where our people have come and where we are today. Black men and black women who are living out that hope in a real way, who are living epistles, storytellers, their lives are narratives. That practical human witness can be emulated. Reverend Keith Williams is president of the National African American Fellowship that serves the Southern Baptist denomination. This was a, a convention that started on the wrong side of slavery. In 1845, the Southern churches supported slavery and broke away from its Northern congregation, who concentrated on building schools and universities to educate newly freed slaves. There was a perceived threat to educating freed men and women in the late 1800s. Jeffrey Hagre is the newest executive director for the Northern Congregations, now known as the American Baptist Home Mission Societies. You can regain. For many, the thought of people going from working in the plantations and in the fields one day. I'm going to press on. And then on the next day, to be enrolled in colleges, in trade schools, and in seminaries and Bible colleges as though they were full participants in the American way of life was kind of unsettling to some. Well, the Bible calls us as Christians to be ministers of reconciliation. We are called to help men and women, boys and girls, get right with Almighty God. For the issue really is not skin, but it's sin. Now healed from his generational trauma, Reverend Williams calls on his own denomination to heal from its past racial history. I think they needed to understand the effects of 300 years of free labor of, of African Americans in bondage and slavery and the effects that it had on the African American community and how that our churches were the centrality of our communities. It's time that red and yellow, black and white, who are all precious in his sight, come together and stand up and be the people of God. Basically, as a child growing up, I, I didn't learn early on that the Southern Baptists came because they were supporting slavery. 
Reverend David Waltz, a lifetime Southern Baptist, knows that his denomination needs to heal from its dark blot in history. I heard it was because they were so committed to missions that, uh, and they wanted to have their missionaries still be able to serve. Today, the Southern Baptists claim 16 million members from all ethnic backgrounds. And after 150 years from its controversial beginnings, they made an unprecedented and brave move. We can join collectively in apologizing to African Americans, specifically, and anyone else generally, for wrongs that have been done across the years. When we issued that apology, it was a significant point of beginning of healing <laughs> to be able to own the problem, admit the problem, um, name it. Uh, it gives you power over it to, to begin to do something about it. Since then, we've been trying to work together to treat e every individual that was made in the image of God. And so we're one in Christ. We all come from one blood that we might truly be the people of God. It is so humbling to think that they could still love us and forgive us. Uh, and, you know, it's collective sin. Uh, you know, it's not like I was there, but yet I was there uh, in the sense that that's, that's a part of our heritage. And yet it's a gift. About one third of our churches are predominantly African American. Uh, the fact that they have participated, prayed for me, cared for me, is so humbling. How would one experience Christianity more through oppression, through systematic oppression, one would argue, inflicted by one's captors, is the greatest setup for the gospel I could give you. It is the message of the cross. It is reconciliation on the party that's been offended. Our faith is one that says, love, turn the other cheek, forgive. I'm interested in equipping emerging generations, millennials, young people with self-worth and dignity to project their hopes and dreams beyond the current injustices and work around reconciliation. Dr. Jeffrey Hagray promises to keep with his church's historical identity and protects freedoms for all people. And so when we retell the story, uh, we are not bemoaning some distant past, but we are saying that, uh, in the words of James Weldon Johnson, lift every voice and sing, we have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. started as a poem and is now known as the Negro National Anthem. It tells the story of the sojourn of African peoples from slavery, enslavement, from injustice, all the way to, to freedom. Our work is not done. Our work is not done. Laws can change some things, but they do not automatically change hearts. That takes faith, religion, philosophy, culture, uh, the arts. She said her laugh was too free. Through the arts, Courtney Williams Stotts understands her ancestral history. By retelling the story, she ultimately heals the pain of generational trauma. The play is called Flying West. My character, I was not a slave, but my parents were. Whereas my other sister, she was actually a former slave. So you see the difference between those two and how they were raised. So because we're Negroes, we have to write differently and sing spring differently? It helps me remember where I came from and where my roots come from. The fact that I'm only about four generations away from slavery and seeing how it's really not that far away 
and seeing how some of the things they still talk about still happen today. Isn't there any other way, sister? It's kind of sad in a way, but it's humbling. Considering the life that my great grandmother and my grandmother had, I think most of the time our generation is a little bit more privileged and because we don't have the same um, experiences and hardships that they had to go through. They're one in five. In most families, you'll find some area where there's some kind of generational curse. There's something that's been passed down generation to generation that just seems to be the stigma, the challenge for that particular family. And I feel that was, all, that was broken with my father. We're, we're going to get it together. You watch. Yeah. It stopped with him. Well, I'm real proud of you. And I believe that with him being the patriarch of our family, um, being that individual that really, you know, chose to serve the Lord first in our family, it, it communicated to our entire family. So it was retro and it's been, and it's future. A future free from the pain of the past. That's Laura, that's June, that's Louise. Without Doris Elizabeth Williams Howard, I wouldn't be where I am today because of her sacrifice. A mother's sacrifice allowed this pastor to work through his generational trauma. Now healed, Reverend Keith Marshall Williams leads his extended family to deepen their own faith. Now you come to Nazarene Baptist Church on Sunday morning. My 98-year-old grandmother sitting here. My 77-year-old mother's here. My two sisters are here. My, my daughter runs the choir. My brother is in the bass player. My other brother's in the choir. My kids, when they were here, they were all in college. Uh, my son was here in, uh, in the choir. My daughter's in the choir, runs the choir. My baby girl was singing in the choir. She's in college now. And uh, the whole family is here. My uncle's the security guard. So the Lord has used what he's done in my life to revolutionize my family. He give us all power. And see, beloved, if you know that you have power underneath the skin, in the unseen realities of life that men don't understand, it ought to change the way you worship. That is the type of legacy that I want to continue in my own way. The essence and the content of what he speaks, I believe, lives in me. And it's my heart to make sure that the energy that he expresses here every Sunday flows through me as well. I don't want them to forget him when they look at me. For nearly a century, Hattie Marshall Williams says she received many of God's blessings. Today, she is grateful for her six children, 18 grandchildren, 23 great-grandchildren, and 15 great-great-grandchildren, including the youngest, five-year-old Layla. I love the fact that she has a relationship with her great-great-grandmother and her great-grandmother and her great-grandfather and, and how close they are. I want Layla to know who she is. I want her to be proud of who she is. Does anybody know who Emmett Till was? After 60 years of holding pain in her heart, Phyllis Smith decides to publicly share her story. And I'm ready to continue the process of healing and to tell the story to the, the younger ones who um, really weren't around. I have forgiven the people who killed my cousin Emmett. And I want the world to know that when we forgive somebody, we're not letting them off. We're not saying that, you know, you didn't commit a crime that's heinous. What we're saying is the right one to give you the penalty is God. And so who better to decide what the penalty should be? Not me. God should decide. That there's no trial or trauma, there's no situation or circumstance that God can't take and righteously refers. The story of my cousin's murder, Emmett Till, has become um, just a marvelous picture of God working in the world. I love story. It reminded me of the verse in the Bible, Genesis, the 50th chapter and the 20th verse, you meant this for evil, but God meant this for good to the saving of lives. This is what's helped me to overcome the pain, the hurt, the devastation, the psychological damage, the emotional damage. I'm a different person. I'm not the person I was, and it's because of God. Well, 
It's interesting that the Bible frames the concluding moment of salvation history as a supper, as a feast. And I imagine from heaven ill, I dream that I went to a city called glory. It's a dream, it's a vision, and I'm setting my eyes on the vision. And it's a vision of victory. We will have the victory. Uh, God will win. God has won. There is a lot of joy around good food. And there is new food and new wine and a great experience. And there at the table are the children of God. I always tell them that this down here is dress rehearsal. We're all going to be around the throne of God celebrating. And you have to surmise from the account of Revelation that it's people of every tribe, every tongue, of every nation. And then bringing that pain to Christ and saying, Christ, please. You died for sin and everything sin entails. Please take this pain and bring healing to my heart. And uh, it's beautiful, yeah, it's beautiful. Every language of every socioeconomic background, we trust Jesus Christ that make it to this table. One of the joys is that Christians believe that we have a God that actually wants to heal us, wants us to be healed, and wants our neighborhoods and our nations to be healed. And there's a lot of hope that comes from that. And the only way that you come is you need to be some relation to the Lamb we see that great, grand, glorious vision. Martin Luther King Jr. who said that he looked forward to the day when his little children would be able to hold hands with white children and be free. What, what a, a tremendous vision that was. That one day everything that's divided now will be brought together. The rough places then will have been made smooth. The crooked places will have been made straight. And the glory of God will be revealed and manifest throughout the world. That's the marriage supper. Amen and amen. Wait for me inside the gate. Come on.